Keep it locked to KPFA 94.1 FM in the Bay Area, KFCF 88.1 FM in the Central Valley, or listen online at kpfa.org. I'm Brian edwards Teekert. See you at 7. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. The time is 2 p.m. Stay tuned next for Terra Verde. Don't talk about the weather. It's a military secret. Just keep your wits together. That's the safest way to keep it. The president believes drastic changes to the environment pose a bigger threat in the daily lives of Americans than terrorism. And for the sake of future generations, our generation must move toward a global compact to confront a changing climate while we still can. The co-founder of the Weather Channel now says man-made global warming is a myth. But then there's the more print and distract. What is geoengineering? If you uh, uh, reflect away a little more sunlight by adding reflective aerosols, tiny particles, say, to the upper atmosphere. And how do you do that? Uh, you could do it with aircraft, for example. These are critical times. Be careful of espionage. In such critical times, you've got to watch out for sabotage. Welcome, Bay Area and beyond. You're tuned to Terra Verde, the weekly environmental talk show on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno. I'm Laura Gadson, your host. In 2011, then-Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad accused European countries of using special equipment to force clouds to dump water on their continent instead of his Again in 2012, he blamed the West for destroying Iran's rain clouds and thereby crippling its agriculture. Ahmadinejad called the alleged campaign to drought out Iran a deliberate, premeditated act of war. Claims of this nature may seem far-fetched to most Westerners, but there are those who believe the former Iranian president may have been onto something. All it takes is a cursory search of the mainstream press to see that China has openly conducted weather modification programs for years, most famously during the Beijing Olympics in 2008. I'll leave that query up to you for another time, because right now we're going to focus in on the disturbing potential that weather and climate modification could be happening right here in California and elsewhere, right above our heads. When you hear the words climate modification, you might think I'm referring to the anthropogenic or human-caused greenhouse gas emissions that scientists overwhelmingly agree is at the root of the climate shifts we are experiencing worldwide. You know, the burning of fossil fuels, Arctic methane release, deforestation, and the like. Actually, I'm talking about a type of human intervention that is in some ways more limited in scope in terms of its sources, but has the potential to be limitless in its ramifications in terms of its impact on all of us. Here with me to wrestle with the implications from their own points of view are my two guests, Dane Wigington, lead researcher for geoengineeringwatch.org, and lawyer Bill Blackwell. Before we begin, I want my listeners to know I made an earnest effort to bring panelists with perspectives different from Dane's and Bill's to this show. My invite attempts faltered because these issues are just extremely contentious. It's a long story, but I'll just say for now, I sincerely hope I'll have the opportunity to continue investigating weather and climate intervention matters and sharing diverse insights with you for everyone's sake. Now I'd like to welcome Dane Wigington to Terra Verde and to the KPFA Airwaves. Hello, Laura. Thanks for addressing this critical issue. Thank you for joining us. Please take the stage and, and kindly explain what is geoengineeringwatch.org. Geoengineeringwatch.org is a website intended to be a tool of research for those who truly desire to find out what's happening in the skies above their heads. We sell nothing. We're non-political, simply to be used as a resource. That's the sole purpose of the site, sole reason I'm in this battle. And how long have you been in this battle? About 12 years. The site's been up about since 2009. We're up, just cleared 18 million visitors on the site. We're about 15 to 20,000 per day. Uh, this issue is frontline science uh, around the globe. Uh, it just simply has not been openly admitted to yet. 
Okay, so let's describe the battle itself. Uh, you're, you're implying that you you uh, you're standing against something that's already happening, uh, something that's ongoing. Um, what exactly is it? Can can you explain it to us briefly, if possible? In climate engineering, in the attempt to manipulate Earth's weather systems on a global scale, and the primary stated goal, Laura, is solar radiation management to deflect some of the sun's incoming thermal radiation. But this is a, an extremely tunnel-visioned approach to the planet's life support systems, not unlike the pharmaceutical approach to the human body. Take this for one ailment, and here's 20 more things that are exponentially worse. But when we're talking about the military-industrial complex, uh, that's how they see the world, through a, a prism uh, not taking the consequences into account. And we believe most of the people in the military participating are being told, of course, they're doing something for the common good. But when we add in weather warfare, as you just openly mentioned, we think Iran, what's been done to them is the tip of the iceberg. Data indicates that is the case. This covert weapon has been used around the globe, continues to be used. So it's not really about the common good when we get right down to the nuts and bolts. It's about power and control. And tell us about some precedents in, in history that might back that idea that this could be happening and the, the actual motivation is power and control. Well, let's look at historical, historically documented instances. Project Popeye in Vietnam. The U.S. was so successful at weather modification over the Ho Chi Minh Trail that by 76, the U.N. passed provisions forbidding weather modification in wartime. But it appears nobody pays attention to international law, of course. And we have a long string of circumstances where there were protracted drought and then U.S. occupation was subsequently allowed. From the sub-Saharan African countries, we look at every single Middle Eastern country, not just Iran, Syria, Iraq, Libya, all of them subjected to record drought prior to destabilization of their country. And it's important for people to understand. The climate science community tries to convince us that we should see that much more record drought with global warming, global warming being very real, of course. But the atmosphere carries 7% more moisture for every degree of centigrade warming. Overall, on a warming planet, it should rain more, not less. Why do we have these targeted countries that are very strategically advantageous for the U.S. and the NATO powers being droughted out? And you mentioned the U.N. attempting to do something about the some of the early cases that seem to be out there. I, I know I'm pretty sure you can actually look up old uh, newspaper articles on what went down. Um, you mentioned Project Popeye. You can. Um, so let's talk b- briefly about NMOD, uh, the now known as uh, or once known as the Convention on the Prohibition of Military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques entered into force October 78. It was uh, banning weather warfare. What's the status now? Well, those provisions hold, but does anybody pay attention? And that's the key thing. And when we have our top U.S. military leaders, and, and I would encourage anybody to please investigate what I'm saying. Don't believe anything I'm saying. and Just investigate. We have all the top U.S. military leaders stating, as you correctly said, about the Obama administration, that the greatest and most immediate threat in their mind, and I would certainly agree, is climate change. So why would we expect that they are not engaged in these programs, given that we know weather warfare is taking place around the globe, given that we know that China's engaged in weather modification, we know Russia's engaged in weather modification, and we have a document I found in the NASA archives from 66 outlining the U.S. weather mod programs, even as of that time, with it's 80 pages long of presidential documents posted on geoengineeringwatch.org, budgets in the hundreds of millions of dollars, 10 federal agencies involved, 12 major universities involved. This is the biggest elephant in the room, period. So, again, to, to think that they would not be engaged in these programs, I think, is very naive thinking. The problem is what they're doing, as I outlined earlier, is making an already horrific global warming scenario far worse overall, not better. And before we get more into that, the global warming. Uh, let's let's look more a little bit more at history, and I want to bring up the nuclear issue. I believe it was just on the air um, right before we got on here on KPFA. So I want to make sure we we bring that up. I mean, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, the legacy of the scientific research that went into the, to the early days of of nuclear um, technology development and how that might serve also as uh, a precedent in history for what we're seeing now? Well, if we relate that to people's response that they, those in power, would not do this to themselves. And I often use the the nuclear testing as an example of what they have done to themselves and the rest of us. We have over 2,000 nuclear detonations that have occurred on planet Earth, and don't they know that 
it works after maybe a few dozen, and everything on Earth is contaminated from the nuclear fallout. Now, if we look at even nuclear power and what they are doing to themselves and the rest of us, again, we have Fukushima that may kill us all. If it continues, there's no known technology to fix Fukushima, and yet there's 60 more nuclear facilities on the drawing boards right now. Obama just approved, and I'm picking on him. I mean, we have every uh, presidential uh, administration going all the way back uh, proving, approving nuclear power, but Obama's just approved $6.5 billion for two more new plants in Georgia, for example, 60 more on the board globally. Um, is this not insanity? So when people think that that the weather would not be intentionally manipulated for a long list of reasons by those in power. And we have historical documentation of it happening. We have film footage of, this is important, we have film footage of U.S. military tankers at altitude spraying the aerosols that are outlined in geoengineering patents. We have so much data, Laura. We've just, we're just asking people to investigate. All right. Um, Bill Blackwell, let's bring you into the conversation. Um, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thank you, Laura, for having me on. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, and you're also here in California, correct? Uh, actually, uh, state line Nevada, just two miles from California. Oh, okay. Yeah, I forgot to mention um, Dane is, is a fellow Californian, um, so we're all speaking from our, our reference point here. Um, so, Black, Mr. Blackwell, um, how did you get involved in um, this issue, and where do you stand? Um, and, uh, you know, you're a lawyer, so you obviously have a legal perspective we're very interested to hear. Yeah, well, actually, um, my wife, uh, Angela Black, has a, has a, has a radio show, uh, and has had Dane on, uh, her show in the past. And she kind of is the one that, uh, brought me into, uh, this area, um, uh, four years ago when we moved up here to Lake Tahoe. Uh, you know, she, we'd get in the car and she'd start talking about, you know, the, the airplanes flying over and the you know, long, you know, uh, you know, the smoke trail coming out from the, from the back of the plane. And, and uh, you know, and I just thought it was, you know, you know, United Airlines. And, and but, you know, uh, over time, uh, I started listening to the people that she had on her show. I started looking at, at Dane's website uh, and started doing my own research, my own investigation. And, you know, and came to the conclusion that this is real, that there's aerosol spraying going on, that uh, these contaminants are coming down upon us. Uh, we had a, um, uh, a, a a conference two weeks ago up in Reading, which uh, it, I was uh, a part of uh, and honored to be, uh, and I had farmers coming up to me with tears in their eyes, um, telling me that their trees were dying, uh, that their crops, uh, the yield on their crops were way down, and, and if it, this continued, uh, that they were going to lose their farm. Now, uh, and so, uh, so I'm involved in this. I'm, I'm very happy to be involved in it. It's the most important thing I, I think I've ever done. Uh, and there's a, uh, uh Dane has put together, uh, we have a legal team of uh, seven attorneys, uh, two, uh, from Canada. Uh, we're working, uh, together with them. Uh, so when the time comes, uh, to file an action, uh, against the powers to be, uh, we're going to coordinate with our Canadian brothers, and and they're going to file approximately at the same time. So, hopefully, we get a media bounce on this, um, because the media, as as you uh, talked about at the very beginning, uh, Laura, uh, you know, uh, it's hard to get the people to uh, to report on this, and so that's one of our that's one of our goals is to get the media reporting on this, so that the average individual you uh, have some information. Because I didn't know, I didn't know what chemtrails were. I didn't know what aerosol spraying, what, what HARP was, you know, four years ago. I was, you know, doing my, I was in my office in my, you know, in Los Angeles, uh, you know, working, you know, 15 hours a day. And I, I, I didn't have time to, you know, to, to look at these things. So, um, so that's how I, that's how I, I came aboard. Thanks to my wife and, and, and people like Dane. Okay. Thank you for, for telling us that, um, your transition. I know it's, um, I met a lot of people who are doing this kind of research, and uh, there's usually a pretty clear memory of when they began to um, become aware and and do the research. And it is hard because there are so many sources online, and, and it's hard to know you know where where it's all coming from. But uh, I want to swing back to Dean because I know that there are a lot of people who've done their own testing. Like you said earlier, you don't necessarily have to believe everything that um, Dane is saying or Bill is saying or anybody. Um, there's ways that you can do your own testing. Um, so. Um, let's let's talk about that. I mean, uh, Bill also mentioned some farmers um, dealing with some issues of yield loss at their farms in this area. So, Dane, tell us about some of those findings that people have been coming up with, some of the ones that stand out to you the most. 
First of all, in the testing, it's important for me to say that we know absolutely positively that some labs are now giving back scrubbed results. We know that because we've sent out duplicate samples. We believe this is because some labs don't want in the middle of this controversy, not because of uh, some somebody from above necessarily saying anything, but when we have lab owners now, a new owner of the state lab in Northern California is telling his clients that it's normal to have rain filled with aluminum. That's a blatant, glaring, incredibly massive lie. So in regards to the material that we know is in the precipitation, initial lab tests, this is what fueled my investigations early on. I had lab tests at the state lab from seven parts per billion, which is already high for aluminum, shouldn't be in the rain. Again, although aluminum is very abundant in the Earth's strata, it does not exist in the environment in free form, period. It must be mined, refined, and dispersed before it can be in the environment in free form, bioavailable form. So we had lab tests, the amount of aluminum in the rain, which means it's in the air column, escalate as much as 50,000% within a year to 3,450 parts per billion. So this being a primary element in climate engineering patents, aluminum, because of its reflective qualities, and it's uh, the albedo is what they're trying to increase in the planet, the reflectivity to put reflective particles in the atmosphere. That's why aluminum is, is a primary element. So when we see this massive amount of aluminum saturating everything, and by the way, let's relate this, if, we, if I can, momentarily to something everybody knows about, Laura, the bee colony collapse disorder that's still being related only to the farm chemicals, which are bad. But how many people have seen the headlines? And this is from Science Daily. Here's one new factor in the decline of bee populations, aluminum. From CNN, are bees getting dementia? From uh, the Daily Mail, bees suffer dementia due to aluminum. We're seeing bees with peer-reviewed study with 70 times more aluminum in them than what it takes to cause Alzheimer's and dementia in a human being. Whales, whale study from 1,000 whales around the globe, packed with aluminum. Aluminum is now everywhere. Bioavailable aluminum matches the patents, raining down on us. And for NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, study from 2010 stating on the record, in the last decade, from 2000 to 2010, atmospheric particulates doubled, and they don't know where half of them came from. Isn't that a bit of a red flag? I mean, how big does the elephant in the room need to be? And it's important for people to understand on a, quote, condensation trail. And we have a tutorial on the homepage of Geoengineering Watch to show the design characteristics of a high-bypass turbofan jet engine. That's all commercial aircraft, all military tankers, by design, because it's just a jet-powered fan. It's nearly incapable, nearly incapable, of producing a condensation trail, except under the most extreme circumstances. So when we have film footage of nozzles visible on the plane, still photographs of the nozzles on the planes, we have so much data that's absolutely irrefutable, Laura. Okay, well, I just I, I wanna, might add. Oh, can I jump in and then and then you can continue, Bill? Sure. I just want to say uh, for those who are tuning in that we're uh, this is KPFA ninety four point one FM KPFB in Berkeley and KFCF in Fresno, and we're talking about um, some pretty ambitious sounding uh, terms like solar radiation management, stratospheric aerosol geoengineering, albedo modification. Um, these are unorthodox strategies that are supposed to be countering global warming um, that some people claim that may already be underway, and there seems to be evidence to suggest that. So um, back to you, Bill. No, I was just uh, going to uh, add on to what Dane was saying. Um, there was, in uh, uh, 1991, a patent was issued to Hughes Aircraft. Uh, it was called the Wellsbach patent, uh, and this patent was designed uh, for the nozzle spraying of chemicals uh, from planes. So this is a patent that, that was designed uh, in 91. Um, Boeing now, uh, I believe, uh, owns the patent. But, uh, and people can go, you know, people can go to the, the patent office and, and look this up, uh, and research for themselves. But the, you know, these things exist and, and, and that's what's happening. And there, you don't actually have to go to the patent office necessarily, right, Dan? There, there's a list of patents that are related to these issues that they can find on your website, correct? Correct. About 150 of them. That, that again, in the primary purpose, it's important for people to understand the stated purpose is to increase the Earth's albedo, its reflectivity. But there's a list of downstream consequences that is uh, far more horrific than any perceived benefit from these programs. But there's just too many people. Uh, there's too much power being exercised. And again, the weather warfare aspect, there's so many layers to this, this issue. And, and really, when we get right down to it, none of it for the common good. 
There's another layer. You br- I briefly mentioned HARP, and a lot of people, I'm assuming here in the Bay Area, have heard of this, um, but I'll just say it's the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program, which was a, um, a facility based near Gakona, Alaska, although the, the word is that it was defunded, um, but I just wanted to, to get your, your take on that and tie it into the, the, the other issues that we've been talking about. Uh, the, the PR that was put out that it was defunded or decommissioned is all smoke and mirrors. We held to that position when all this publicity came out. It's absolutely not shut down, still online, just, just a sleight of hand to private ownership. Uh, HARP is an ionosphere heater. It's an it, it unimaginably powerful ground-based radio frequency transmitter, 3.5 billion watts in the case of HARP. There's about three dozen of these facilities around the globe, large ground-based, an unknown number of other facilities, SBX radar. These facilities are used to manipulate the electrically conductive particulates once they're in the atmosphere. They can cause these particulates when exposed to radio frequency to repel each other and scatter more efficiently across the atmosphere. And this can be used to diminish and disperse rainfall, to expand the reflective cloud cover, which by the way also traps heat, shreds the ozone layer. Again, the downstream consequences are horrific. One thing your listeners can sense with their own skin, Laura, is the incredibly intense UV radiation that we're now being exposed to as a direct consequence of the shredding of the ozone layer from the climate engineering programs. We're seeing UVB levels a thousand percent higher than we're being told. It's burning the bark off of trees, causing them to drop foliage, killing plankton. Again, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah, I'm going to assume that some of our our listeners here will have seen some of this evidence or felt it, um, although maybe not understanding um, or not taking on this this perspective. Um, And it's really it's it's a matter of just getting um, these ideas out there for people to, like we said earlier, be able to do the investigations, because in this day and age, um, there's there's really many, many ways to find out more um, about these issues. and I want to get more 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 into the testing again uh, along these lines because some people are just really only going to believe what they either see with their own eyes, and that's understandable. I'm kind of in that camp myself, um, or or somehow test it with you know in their own um, realm of, of control. So let's talk about some other ways that people can do testing. I've heard something about human hair testing, and and we'll we'll also we should talk about. Um, medical impacts and then I, I can bring Bill back in because I know he's dealing with that as well on humans on the testing hair blood or urine if you test in blood or urine chelation before testing prior to testing is essential to get proper results because the materials are not necessarily migrating around they're adhered to cell receptors but every human test subject that's properly tested that we know of is showing off the scale levels of the same metals named in geoengineering patents aluminum barium and so forth Every ailment that we would expect to see escalate with the exposure to these metals is going through the roof. A 10,000% increase in autism since 1975. Now we're told by MIT in less than 10 years, one out of two children will have autism. You think that would be a headline somewhere. One out of three seniors dies with Alzheimer's and or dementia today in the U.S. Not from it, but with it. Again, we see the B situation. We see the aluminum everywhere. So we have film footage of the tanker spraying. I would encourage people to examine that. And we've seen so much metal fall on us, Laura, that we've seen soil pH changes in the Pacific, in the north, northern part of California, Shasta, Siskiyou County, pH changes of 10 to 12 times toward alkaline from 5455 to 6668. Uh, those are unimaginable changes from the aluminum that's falling in the rain. So the, the red flags are everywhere, everywhere. And I assume the pH changes in the soil is going to have a direct impact on anything anybody's trying to grow and then in turn our health that way as well. It does. In addition to that, these are bioavailable metals because of the incredibly small nanoparticulate particle size. So they're, they're uptaken by virtually everything. Uh, it, it invades the entire web of life from the clouds to the ground. So, uh, Bill Blackwell, in your investigation so far in, in beginning to prepare your legal case, uh, tell us about some of the medical issues that you may have encountered in, in the you know potential plaintiffs. Well, we uh, first off, um, uh, uh, attorney by the name of James Grant um, uh, is uh, down in Los Angeles is uh, uh, framing uh, the lawsuit, uh, working with a gentleman by the name of Joe Marlin um, up in um, Auburn. 
uh, or Citrus Heights, California, I should say. And um, uh, I wanted to get back to the conference, if I could, just briefly. We we set up. Um, first off, it, it was standing lonely. I think I think you were even there, Laura, for a few for a few, few minutes. Yeah, um, I managed to pass through definitely. Yeah, we we set up a table to have people sign up uh, uh, for the per, for the specific purpose of informing us as to whether or not they had been injured uh, health wise, or if uh, such as uh, the farmers that came up to me if, if their crops had been damaged, uh, and so that we could reach out to them. I know uh, Dane has compiled uh, that list together and, and has sent it to me. So I'm going to be contacting. I think there were uh, probably 75, 80 people that put their names down. Uh, I'm going to be contacting each and every one of them, uh, along with some of the other people on our legal team, uh, to write up summaries to find out what their complaints are. From this, we hope to, uh, first of all, uh, get some witnesses that would that would testify uh, uh, in our trial that, uh, that is going to come, uh, and will possibly uh, be a plaintiff uh, against the defendants in this case. Um, and so that so that research is just is is, is going to start here as soon as I get this list uh, from from the people up in the Reading area that, that turned out. Great. So if you're interested, stay tuned. I'm sure we can find out more about how that plays out in in the months to come. And thank you so much, Bill, for joining us today. Bill Blackwell, I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Laura. Appreciate it. Okay, so we have uh, about a minute and a half, Dane, uh, for you to say your final words and, and put any um, sites or links out that you think people might need to or want to check out. Um, go for it. This is the bottom line. I mean, no environment, no people. And I'm certainly, I've always been an environmentalist, but in the in the full sense of the word, and if, if we have a, an issue that encompasses everything else, it supersedes everything else, and geoengineering is that issue, must we not focus on that issue? programs that are shredding the ozone layer, completely disrupting the planet's weather and life support systems, the hydrological cycle, toxifying soils, waters, and indeed every breath we take is laden with these particles. The lab tests prove it. We have multiple, uh, many, many lab tests from around the globe on Geoengineering Watch posted. So if this is the hole in the bottom of the boat on which everything else depends, must we not deal with this issue first and foremost? That's why I'm in this battle. So I encourage everyone to please investigate, and we must prioritize. If we don't deal with geoengineering, if we don't stop the deliberate and intentional and destructive intervention with Earth's life support systems, very soon nothing else will matter. So I, I only hope that people will investigate the issue, help us to sound the alarm. Thank you, Dane. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Laura. So, yes, you've heard it here. Um, as I said, this is one perspective. There's obviously many, many more. Uh, you can read about geoengineering in the mainstream media, uh, but you're not going to hear the same perspectives as you will here on KPFA. Uh, so thanks for tuning in, everybody. Um, many, many thanks to my guests, Bill Blackwell and Dane Wigington of geoengineeringwatch.org. Uh, once again, I urge you to make your own observations, do your own testing, do your own investigating, keep your eyes out, look up, see how the sky looks, see if it looks okay to you, if you remember seeing skies like that in years past, and please stay sharp. Thanks to Erica Bridgman on the controls and Apollo for mixing the intro. For more from me, you can find me tweeting at Earth Media Arts. Signing off, this is Laura Gatlonchika for KPFA and an Enduring Earth. If your eyes work, yeah, you must can see. What I think about is just reality. Can say, or if your eyes can see, Babylon is praying over you and me. If your ears work, yeah, you must hear me. Babylon is changing our reality. This long time, the government break and the money that is shine. The people don't know, but them don't talk why. You think it's a conscious, you are them alive. I love me your barrier of the spread is sky. Jungles, we are one January. Hello there, I'm Quincy McCoy, General Manager of KPFA, inviting you to join us Thursday, October 22nd, when New York Times bestselling author David Talbot discusses his jolting new book, The Devil's Chessboard, Alan Dulles, the CIA, and the Rise of America's Secret Government. 
David Talbot is the founder and former CEO of Salon.com and the author of bestsellers Brothers and the Seasons of the Witch. I look forward to talking with David about the rise of America's secret government at the First Congregational Church in Berkeley, 2345 Channing Way. There is wheelchair access at this important KPFA event. Advanced tickets are available at brownpapertickets.com and supportive independent bookstores. Or you can find out more information at kpfa.org. For David Talbot, live October 22nd. See you there.